We'll uh, get started. The goal for today's lecture is to talk about convex functions and convex sets. So, do has anyone seen convex sets before? Yes. Yeah. Correct. 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 How does that, like, intuitively, can you explain why does eigenvalue represent the variance? Eigenvalue represent the variance? Along each component? Uh, I think it's beyond the course. You could have asked me before the lecture started. <laughs> yeah. We can talk about it after the lecture. Okay. Uh, in any uh, so how many of you have seen convex sets before have you studied convex set in a class okay perfect few of you so a set x it's a subset of rn and x is convex this is the definition x is convex if and only if for every x, y in capital X, for every alpha in 0, 1, alpha x plus 1 minus alpha y also lies in the set x. So pictorially, I have two sets. Let's call this x1. Let's call this x2. So I have two sets, x1 and x2. I pick arbitrary two points. So for every x, y in x. So I pick arbitrary two points, x and y. And I draw a line segment between x and y. And the line segment is the straight line between x and y. So any point here can be written as alpha x plus 1 minus alpha y. So depending on what value of alpha you pick, if alpha is equal to 1, then this is x. If alpha equals to 0, then you get y. And if you pick an alpha between 0 and 1, you get a point in the, on this line segment. So no matter which two points I pick, x and y, I draw a line segment in between that line, in between those points. That entire line segment lies within the convex set, within the set x itself. Okay, let's do the same thing here. So I pick two points. Let me call it x1 and y1. I draw a line segment. That seems to be within the set x2. I pick another two points and I draw a line segment x2, y2. And that line segment happens to be outside of the set x2. And I pick another set of points, x3 and y3, and I draw a line segment. And part of that line is outside the set x2, part of the line is inside the set x2. Okay? So this set is not a convex set. That's because here, so in this set it is convex because no matter which two points I pick, the entire line segment lies within x1, whereas in this case, I can always pick points 
so that the line segment goes outside the set X2. As a result of which, this is not convex. And this is convex. So that's what this definition is saying. X is convex. If for every X and Y in the set capital X, and for every alpha between 0 and 1, alpha X plus 1 minus alpha Y should lie within the capital set X, within the convex set capital X. Uh, X, Y is just uh, two points. Two points okay, in the set. In the vector space. Yeah. It's, I mean, not a vector space, but a subset of a vector space. Okay. Why is that, in, why is that distinction important? A subset of a vector space? Um, vector space has a very specific meaning in math. Uh, it should extend all the way to infinity and all that. Okay, so yeah. we're saying that this is not infinite. Right. So in this case, it's not infinite, but if you look at a plane, then the plane is a vector space as long as it passes through origin. Uh, but 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 the plane extends all the way to infinity, so that's a vector space. I mean, you can call it a vector space, but it's still actually a subset of a much bigger vector space. <coughs> so convex doesn't necessarily mean it has to extend all the way to infinity. I'm surprised some people know these distinctions. I mean. You guys know about vector space and, and all that stuff, the terms. Um, have you guys taken a course in analysis? No? Have you taken a course in analysis? Real analysis. No? OK. All right. Uh, so let's look at some examples of a convex set. So. So sphere, should I say sphere or ball? I think let me call it ball. So ball of radius R. So all the points X such that the P norm of X is less than or equal to R. And this P of course lies between one and infinity. So infinity is also included. This is the ball of radius R. Second is a uh, um, sorry, what sign is that? This? Not the other one. Here? Yeah. R. Radius R. <laughs> uh, then a hyperplane. X such that AX equals to B. Then third is X such that AX is less than equal to B. Okay, so these are all examples of convex sets. On the other hand, if you pick this sphere, x such that xp is equal to r, this is not convex. So just the sphere, just the covering is not a is not a convex set because the if you pick any two points and you draw a line between them, that line basically doesn't lie within the within the surface of the sphere. It actually goes through the sphere. So that's why if you have equality sign here, it's not a convex set. If you have less than equal to sign here, then it becomes a convex set. 
okay so keep that in mind a ball a solid ball everything included inside the ball that is a convex set but a sphere is not a convex set one important thing to note is intersection of convex set is a convex set c1 c2 c3 cn convex let me call it m because n is already taken then intersection of ci i equals 1 to m is convex so if i pick a ball hyperplane and this set and i take the intersection it's a convex set union is not but intersection is a convex set any question so far yes Can you say that again? Is this all considering only real values? Only real values here. Yeah. We are not talking about complex numbers at all in this class. Okay. Any questions? So how do we prove this mathematically? Oh, this one? I'll leave it as an exercise, but the way to think about it is if x and y is in this set, then x and y is in all of these sets. And so the line segment between x and y will also be in all these sets because each of them are convex. So the line segment will also be in this set. Okay. How about the rest of like uh, three? Uh, again, very easy. So if you pick x one and x two, that satisfies. Let me prove this one. Uh, by the way, this inequality is element-wise inequality. So whenever in optimization we use like a vector is less than equal to another vector, it means that each element satisfies that equality that inequality. Okay, so x1, x2 lies in this set, which means a x1 equals to b, a x2 equals to b. So a alpha x1 plus one minus alpha x2 equals to alpha. A x one plus one minus alpha A x two, which is equal to B. Yes. Uh, so plane is typically two dimensional hyperplane could be multi dimensional object so when we talk about n dimensional you when when i talk about n dimensional uh, you can have a plane you can have a line in that n dimensional space you can have a plane in that n dimensional space or you can have a three dimensional four dimensional five dimensional hyperplane so it doesn't so hyperplane means that it's not the entire space it's like a slice of the space but that slice could be multidimensional okay so a is a matrix a is a matrix and b is a vector a is a matrix b is a vector so hyperplane would be more than two dimensions but less than n dimensions of the you know the thing is uh, when if you look at your high school math then you had a plane and you draw a line and you call it a line and then you i don't know go to early undergraduate education and then you draw a three dimensional space and then you draw a plane 
So the hyperplane is basically subsumes everything. So it's a line, it's a plane, it could be like three dimensional, four dimensional, whatever. So you don't necessarily have to make a distinction that it's a one dimensional thing or multi dimensional thing. Um, so the dimension of the hyperplane is equal to the number of rows in this matrix A. Any other question? Awesome. Uh, I'm going to erase this side. Let's talk about convex functions. And there are many ways to define convex functions. So let's look at a few definitions. So I have a function f from x to r. Okay, so it maps n-dimensional object to a real number. So there are, let's define it in two ways. So definition one is epigraph of f, which is defined as x w such that fx is less than or equal to w. is a convex set in Rn cross R. So this is known as epigraph. And we'll see in picture what exactly this means. So I have a function f, so this is my x, this is my f of x or let me call it w. I have a function that looks like this, this is my f of x. So what is epigraph, can someone? Look at the definition of epigraph, look at this figure and tell me what epigraph is. All the space below the yeah. Below? Below and equal to? Yeah. No, it's everything above actually. So all the w which is greater than f of x. So this is my f of x. So all the w that is greater than f of x is above the function. So this entire thing that's epigraph of the function fx. Everything including the function and everything above the function. Okay, so it's a convex set. This is a convex set. So I pick any two points. I draw a line segment. That line segment lies within the set itself. So it's a convex, it's a convex function. So this implies f is convex function. Yes, please. Is this for all functions? Uh, no, any function, any function that satisfies this, any function f such that the epigraph is a convex set, then it's a convex function. Oh, okay. That's how we define the convex function. Let me make it this way. if and only if. So f is a convex function if and only if the epigraph is a convex set.
So that's one definition of convex function and that's called the set theoretic definition of convex function. So the way we define a convex function is we construct a set. If that set is a convex set, then the function is convex. There's another way to define convex function. F is convex. function over x if and only if for every x1, x2 in capital X, for every alpha between 0 and 1, f of alpha x1 plus 1 minus alpha x2 is less than equal to alpha fx1 plus 1 minus alpha fx2. As you can notice, we are not appealing to any set theoretic notion here. We are not constructing a set and calling it a convex set. We are actually looking at the function itself right and we are saying let's say what this is saying i'll let you guys note down and redraw this figure Okay, so here is the figure. I'll let you guys draw the figure as well before I proceed. Which one? I mean, you can call it W. I've just written f of x, but you can call it W. That's okay. We are not using the epigraph notation here. Okay. So the, here is my x1. Here is my x2. I pick an alpha between 0 and 1. Um, so this is my x bar. This point is my x bar. This point. And right above this point on the function, that is my f of x bar, which is f of alpha x1 plus 1 minus alpha x2. Now what that inequality is saying is if I draw a line between f of x1 and f of x2, and I look at this particular point, which is alpha f of x1 plus 1 minus alpha f of x2, then this point lies above this point, lies above f of x bar. So this is my f of x bar, right? So that's what this is saying. f of x bar is less than equal to alpha of f of x1 plus 1 minus alpha of f of x2. This kind of is saying that you draw a line between f of x1 and f of x2, any two points on this line, on this, uh, on this curve, and that line is going to lie above the function itself. I mean, it can, it can be, it can match the function also, or it can be above the function, but it cannot be below the function. Then it's a convex function. Now with the definition of convex, with this definition, we can define something more stricter. So f is 
is strictly convex. over x if and only if this one is not good. For every x1, x2 in capital X, for every alpha in open interval 0, 1. So this is closed interval 0, 1. This is open interval 0, 1. So be careful. So the way we define a strictly convex function is by picking any two points, x1 and x2, picking any value of alpha which is strictly between 0 and 1. So alpha is not equal to 0, alpha is not equal to 1. But it can be anything between 0 and 1. I have a strict inequality here. And that makes it a strictly convex function over x. The distinction? Uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll show you the distinction. So this is a strictly convex function because alpha f of x1 plus 1 minus alpha f of x2 is strictly above this particular function. Now let's look at what is not a strictly convex function. It's, uh, can I, uh, let, me, let me draw it here. So this is my x, this is w. This is my f of x. f of x is just a line. Okay? So if it is just a line, then in that case, you pick any two points and you draw the line segment, it is actually on the function itself. It's not above the function. So therefore it's not a strictly convex it's not a strictly convex function, it's a convex function. I'll draw another function. So it is a straight line here, but it is a curved line on this side, okay? And uh, this is also not a strictly convex function because it is convex here, it is strictly convex here, but overall, it's not strictly convex over the entire domain. Therefore, it's a convex function, but not a strictly convex function. Will this also cause problems since it's not differentiable uh, the entire domain? Yes, uh, so I'll tell you where it causes problem. So this one will not cause problem in optimization because no matter where you start, this is the only minimum point it has. Well, let me draw another function. So now you can start from here and We'll talk about gradient descent maybe in today's class, maybe in the next class. But if you start here, you will come here, but then you don't know which is the, which is the minimum point because you have a multitude of minimum point. You have actually a lot of minimum points. So then that causes problem in the optimization algorithm because, you're, uh, uh, because in this case, uh, you don't know what is the minimum point. There's no true minimum point. There's a whole bunch of minimum points. So you have to define the minimum point as well as how to compute the solution appropriately for these kind of functions. But whenever there is a unique solution, you kind of know you're running the algorithm, you converse to something, you kind of know. If you don't have a unique solution, then you have to keep guessing. Maybe there is a unique solution somewhere else. So it creates a problem because 
you know, you can visually see the function here, but when you actually get a function in real life, you can't really visualize it because it's, it's over uh, n dimensional, it's an n dimensional object. The function is over an n dimensional space. And, uh, you know, visualizing things in million dimensional or billion dimensional spaces are very difficult. Any other question? There are two other ways to define uh, convex functions. I mean, not define, but uh, if the function uh, if the function is differentiable, then you can use that to ascertain whether a function is convex or not. So I'll write the result. f of y is greater than or equal to f of x plus and the second is uh, this is one so f is convex if and only if this holds true. But of course, f has to have a de derivative. If the, if the function f doesn't have a derivative, then of course this statement cannot be applied because f doesn't have this derivative here. But if, if this condition is satisfied for all y and x within the set capital X, then the function f is convex. And the second one is f is convex if and only if second derivative of f is uh, positive semi-definite for all x in capital X. So that's another way to define, but then this requires f to have second derivative. So the second statement is f is convex if and only if the second derivative of f is positive semi-definite at all x. So if the hashing is zero, then that would fulfill the positive semi-definite? Yes, for, uh, so the hashing is zero along this entire line. So it is a positive semi-definite and therefore it's, it's a convex function. So here Hessian is positive, here Hessian is zero, here Hessian is positive. So it's always non-negative, therefore it's a convex function. Now for the strictly convex function, I'll just mention it here, but I'm not going to write it. So if x and y are not the same, then there has to be strict inequality here, then it's a strictly convex function. And if second derivative of f is positive definite for all x, then it's a strictly convex function. Yes? How do we know if a function is positive semi-definite? Uh, it's not a function. So you evaluate the second derivative, you plug in the value of x, then you get a matrix then you, that matrix is positive semi definite. Then you change the value of x and you do the same thing all over again. Um, your matrix is the second part being strictly uh, convex. So for strictly convex, the second derivative has to be positive definite. So the semi word gets deleted. So if it is positive definite for all x, then the function f is strictly convex. I'll have to write a few examples of convex functions. How do you ensure that 
This is true for all x. So it's at x. Yeah, I'll, I'll just show it to you. So f of x equals to norm of x. This is a convex function. And that's because the epigraph is, the epigraph of this particular function is a convex set. So this is x is in R. So if my x is in R, exponential of x is a convex function. How do we know that? What's the first derivative of exponential of x? It's exponential of x. What's the second derivative of exponential of x? Exponential of x. Is exponential of x positive definite for all x in x? It is, because exponential cannot take zero value. It always has to have a positive value. So therefore, this is a convex function. Let's look at the third example, ax. So what is the second derivative of this function? Again, x is in r. So that will be a square exponential of ax. So a square is positive because a is non-zero. So a square is positive, exponential of ax is positive. So it's a convex function. So negative log, this is natural log. So f of x of negative log x, is that a convex function? So I think here x is defined 0 to infinity. Yeah, so the first derivative is minus 1 over x. The second derivative is 1 over x square. 1 over x square is always positive in the domain 0 to infinity. Therefore, it's a convex function. Is it log or natural log? This is natural log. It doesn't really matter though, right? For this it doesn't matter, but then there will be some constants that you need to take care of. The fifth example could be f1 to fn convex. Well, I'll use fm. Then summation of, let me say alpha i fi is convex as long as alpha i is strictly positive. for all i. So I pick a bunch of convex function, I take a convex combination of that function, or just multiply it by some positive number and take the combination, that's also a convex function. Is it the same thing as taking intersection of convex sets? In the epigraph form, that's exactly what will happen. But it's not strictly, uh, so intersection, sorry, so intersection will happen if you take maximum of convex function. So maximum of convex functions is also convex. That's, in, that's equivalent to taking intersection of epigraph, which is a convex set. So I think uh, So maximum of a uh, bunch of convex function is also a convex function. Uh, you can see it very easily in, the, in, in, in a figure. But I think proving it is a bit more difficult and challenging. You have to use uh, the principle of mathematical induction to establish this result. But in figure, 
here is the way to see it. So this is my f1 of x. This is my f2 of x. What's the maximum of f1 and f2? So the maximum is basically this. That's the maximum of f1, x, and f2 of x, and that's a convex function. Is that what you would call like the maxifying? Or is that something different? It's not used for convexifying, but, uh, but what I was saying is that if you look at the epigraph of f1 and epigraph of f2, if you look at the epigraph of maximum of f1 and f2, that's intersection of the two epigraphs. Any other question? So if I pick a maximum of negative log of x at exponential of ax, I get a convex function. But that convex function is only defined between 0 and infinity. OK, so with this, we have finished all the preliminary discussions required for actually doing the optimization, which is the purpose of this class. So let's dive into optimization if there are no further questions on this. Awesome. So in order to talk about optimization, step one is to talk about what is a minimum. So optimization, I am interested in solving. So this is an unconstrained optimization because I don't have a set, subset of Rn. I have like the entire Rn and I'm trying to minimize a function f of x over the entire Euclidean space. So how do we define what is the minimum of a function? So the definition is as follows. X star is a minimum of f if and only if f of x star is less than or equal to f of x for all x in Rn. It's a very simple definition. X star is the minimum of f if f of x star is less than or equal to f of x. This is the unconstrained minimum of f. We'll also define what is known as a local minimum. X star is a local minimum of f if and only if there exists an epsilon greater than 0 such that f of x star is less than or equal to f of x for all x satisfying norm of x minus x star is less than epsilon. So let's try to unpack this definition. I'm going to draw a function.
okay so what is the minimum of this particular function what is the minimum of this function this is the unconstrained minimum this is my x star let me call it x star 0 so this is the unconstrained minimum that satisfies the definition that we have here so x not star is an unconstrained minimum what about local minimum what are the local minimum of this function f of x okay so we have a local minimum here x1 star because I can look at a small open ball around x1 star and the function is minimized at that point any other local minimum yeah so this is a local minimum of the function f because if I look at any small ball of radius epsilon around any point x then I know that f of x star is actually equal to f of x so it satisfies this inequality sign therefore it's a local minimum so all of this all of these points are local minimum so you have three local minimum one is here not three but we have one local minimum here one local minimum here a bunch of local minimum here we have one global minimum here okay and we have a local minimum here and a here I mean sorry local is all three places which we have already covered so the global is as if epsilon approaches infinity uh, yeah you can probably think of it that way it's the minimum the point at which the function is minimum over the entire space I'm a bit I'm a bit concerned about this particular segment which seems to be a local minimum so I'm going to define another quantity called strict local minimum strict local minimum if and only if there exists epsilon greater than zero such that f of x star is strictly less than f of x for all x such that norm of x minus x star is less than epsilon x is not equal to x star then these points are no longer strict local minimum and we have only two strict local minimum one is this and one is this any question yeah because if because x x star lies in this particular set right so trivially f of x star cannot be less than f of x star so I need to remove the x star from the consideration so that's why x is not equal to x star so I'm looking at all the points in the neighborhood except the x star itself and then I want the function to be strictly above f of x star Yes. I know that point is the global minimum. Right. But given this definition, is that point not supposed to be the strictly local minimum? Just the, this point. This point. X1? No, no, no. This one? Yeah. Yeah, so it's a global minimum as well as a local minimum as well as a strict local minimum. It satisfies all these conditions. Does this satisfy this condition? The strict local minimum? Yeah. 
Yeah, it does satisfy. Yeah. See the. I mean the second one. Second one? Yeah. No, no it doesn't. The S one. Comes this one? Yeah. It does satisfy. So I can pick a small epsilon, and the function f is above the function value at x1 star. So this is my f, f of x1 star. I look at any point around x1 star, and the function value is strictly higher than f of x1 star. Right? OK. So I think this is, uh, this is all that we can cover in this class. So next class, we are going to talk about necessary conditions for optimality and sufficient conditions for optimality. So if x star is a minimum, what should the function f satisfy at that particular point of time? And if x star is a strict local minimum, then what is the condition that the function f needs to satisfy? So we'll consider some of these foundational issues about optimization in the next class. We'll talk about necessary condition for optimality, sufficient condition for optimality, and then uh, necessary and sufficient conditions for convex function. So these are the three topics that we will study in the next class, which is going to be on Wednesday because Monday is a long weekend. So have a great long weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Just give me a second. I'll yeah. turn on off the camera. Yeah. Thank you.